All right, great. Really good to see everybody. Um, welcome everyone to the AI and Bias Lunch Talk. I'm Suzette Malvo, the director of the Byron White Center for the Study of American Constitutional Law at the University of Colorado Law School. Um, thank you so much for being here in person and remotely. So I know we have folks that are um, not only here in the state of Colorado, but from all over the country. Um, so, so welcome. So this lunch talk uh, kicks off a conference that we are having on AI and the Constitution more broadly. So I encourage everybody to come out for that. Um, it's going to be here in the law school from 9 to 4 in the Widemeyer courtroom. Or please join us remotely if you can. Um, it's going to be a conversation really on uh, cutting edge issues related to AI when it pertains to privacy, uh, interpretation of the Constitution, and free speech. So the White Center is privileged to be co-sponsoring this event today uh, with the Daniels Fund and with uh, Silicon Flatirons. And in fact, this is part of the Daniels Fund AI Ethics Series. So our topic today, AI and bias, um, is really a perfect blend of issues um, that we, we, each of our centers really deeply care about. So it's a blend of constitutional law, of ethics, and of technology, right? So today our focus is going to be on AI and how it can be, um, how bias can be embedded and replicated in this new technology um, and how that pertains to the practice of law and what we can do to mitigate that risk. Uh, so certainly as part of our professional competence, as part of our ethical obligations, um, lawyers, judges, uh, legal scholars, policymakers, students, leaders, we're all increasingly um, being called to understand AI and grapple with the role that it plays in perpetuating inequalities and unequal access to the justice system. So this interdisciplinary conversation should shed some light on what are some of the um, potential triumphs, um, tragedies of AI as it pertains to court access, constitutional due process, and democracy. So in terms of how we'll proceed today, um, the lunch talk we will have, we'll hear from three different um, distinct vantage points um, for each of our speakers. So each of our speakers will give a talk for about 15 minutes. At 12.55, we're going to go ahead and take a break. At that point, students can rush off to your classes, other people can come in um, and join us. And then at 1 o'clock, we'll start our Q&A with, um, with the general audience, and that'll take us to about 1.30. Uh, so, a uh, quick note about our speakers. So, this is a great, extraordinary group of folks that are here, um, people flying in from all over the world <laughs> to get here this morning. Uh, I'll start with Dr. Newton Campbell. Uh, his expertise is at the intersection of computer science, AI, and space exploration. He is the director of space programs at the Australian Remote Operations for Space and Earth Consortium. Um, that's a lot. <laughs> he is a member of Silicon Flatirons, and he specializes in space, climate change, and ethical AI issues. And he's going to give a talk entitled, AI as the Useful Idiot, Bias Leads to New Security Vulnerabilities in Our Digital Landscape. Uh, following Dr. Campbell will be Professor Spencer um, Overton, he is the Patricia Roberts Harris Research Professor at GW Law School, and he has published extensively on issues related to democracy and race. He has a new article that's coming out, so check it out in the Iowa Law Review called Overcoming Racial Harms to Democracy from Artificial Intelligence. And he's been testifying before Congress on policies, how to stop online disinformation and harmful deep fakes. Uh, Immediately following, we will have Professor Chris Goodman. Uh, she is a law professor at Pepperdine Caruso School of Law, where she's been teaching for over two decades. She writes on equal protection, including implicit bias and algorithmic bias. She is a member of ALI. And she is author of another article, AI, Can You Hear Me? 
promoting procedural due process and government use of artificial intelligence technologies. Um, she is going to present uh, a talk called AI Bias and Council Ethical Implications of Attorney Uses of AI Technologies. So obviously our speakers have a tremendous um, wealth of information and experience. So I'm just going to encourage you to go look at their in-depth bios um, in our, pro in our uh, conference program to learn more about their outstanding um, backgrounds. Um, quickly, in terms of housekeeping, um, for those who are joining us remotely, we're excited to have you. You know that your cameras and video are off. If you have any difficulty, however, just jump into the chat um, and you will get IT support. Um, and for those of you who have registered for the, uh, for, the, for the talk today, you will be getting an email. It will have a recording of the talk. You will get um, a survey. We really ask that you fill it out, give us some feedback, and also CLE instructions. So I'm happy to say for our Colorado lawyers in the house, you get one CLE uh, general credit and one CLE um, ethics credit. And for our students, this, is, um, this qualifies for your care pledge credit. So please uh, pursue that. Um, all right, on that note, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. I know our time is, um, is scarce here, so we're going to go ahead and start with uh, Dr. Um, Newton Campbell and his presentation, AI is the Useful Idiot, Bias Leads to New Security Vulnerabilities in Our Digital Landscape. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for joining us here today. Um, welcome. Thank you everyone. I'd like to, coming from Australia, I've been in Australia for about the last year and a half now. Um, you know, I'd like to just begin by uh, sort of honoring a tradition there, acknowledging um, the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet, the traditional custodians, um, as we often say in Australia, um, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging, I also extend that respect and that acknowledgement to anyone that um, is in the crowd today that's, uh, that um, has that background as well. I'd like to start out by saying that AI is actually doing some really amazing things right now. I know that's not always what we, uh, what we hear at, at a lot of these conferences, but when you think about it, you know, we, we're leveraging AI right now to work on pivotal climate change research, Climate change research with pivotal impact from Earth observation to sensors and detection here on Earth. We're leveraging AI for creating vaccines and new drugs, you know, understanding the human brain, understanding supply chains to help end the world hunger. Um, so many different applications of artificial intelligence are being used for very positive things today. And I, I say all of this because I want to start out by highlighting that you have great AI systems out there doing great work. It's not just the scary stuff, and it's not just the sexy stuff like ChatGPT, right? Um, now, with that said, AI is a powerful tool that can be used to enhance or endanger security, depending on how you use it. But before you should start thinking about you know, what AI can do and some of its impacts on security, you have to start with one simple question. What do we actually care about? So think about that for a second. What do you actually care about? Whether it's your business, in your home, in your family, because security is not just a vague, arbitrary concept. Fundamentally, underneath all of that, all of that discussion that you're having today on AI, underneath all the, all the uh, theory, security is really about protecting what matters to you, whether it's your personal data, uh, your physical well-being, your social relationships, or, or national interests. Security is about safeguarding your interests, your assets, from threats and dangers. Now, if we're going to talk about AI and security, we have to talk about it in terms of systems that are or contain things that we care about. Because systems are what AI cares about. And these systems can be divided into the three categories that you see here. So computer systems, you know, is what you're reading this on, right? It's, it's, a, it's a computer system, something that presents data, transfers data, those sorts of things. You have physical systems, cars, vehicles, um, the brain itself, things like that that interact with the real world. And then you have social systems, democracy, you know, um, you know the, the internet itself. All of these are, at, are social systems that are things that we actually care about and things that we, will, that we actually have to protect. 
Now, AI is still eluding our world and seeping into hidden verticals all the time in unexpected in industries, mostly operating at the intersections of each of those three, those three system areas. The inherent naivete of operating in these areas are what allows AI vulnerabilities to easily be exposed and taken advantage of by unwitting bad actors. What I mean by that is that despite everything you've seen over the last few years, despite AI being used for COVID vaccines, for you know, genetic modification, things like that, addressing immense climate issues, you can, you can quote me on this, AI is still a, an idiot. It's still, <laughs> it's still a useful idiot. <laughs> but it's a particular kind of idiot, and that's important. You know, when I think about implementing AI, you know, I, I tend to think of Kate Darling's example over at MIT, um, MIT Media Labs, where she focuses on leveraging AI almost as a, uh, as a work animal, as a pet. I wanted to do something, and, or I have a job that I'd like some assistance with, I'm gonna program an artificial intelligence to do some of that thing, right? To help me with that thing. But when you think about AI um, from a cyber perspective, you tend to want to think about it as a useful idiot, and potentially as a series of useful idiots that are within an organization, something that does a little bit of thinking that the folks in that organization depend on, but can be taken advantage of by malicious actors. In the world of espionage, um, intelligence officers will often leverage useful idiots to gather new information uh, of or about a, an organization um, a, an entire nation, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and they'll usually trade friendly favors and information without knowing that they're actually being used. That's the key notion that I want to talk about and that I want you to take away from this talk today. When implemented without any nuance or thought, AI is like a clueless spy that doesn't actually know it's a spy. Now, there's a lot of discussion on this. Whenever you hear people saying, hey, you know, AI isn't being used for, you know, or folks aren't concentrating on AI um, bias or, or AI ethics, there are a lot of folks that are actually looking at this, at this topic. So over at Georgetown University, um, those folks have been exploring the number of papers that have been put out about artificial intelligence. So there's been over 6,000 papers at, to date focusing on artificial intelligence um, as an adversary. The use of it as an adversary or, ad, or adversarial um, activity regarding artificial intelligence. Typically, there's a few kinds of attacks that focus on, on the use of artificial intelligence um, in, in, in the cyber world. So there's direct injection attacks, and that kind of attack um, an adversary directly inputs deceptive data into the AI system. I have a prompt. I'm going to try to manipulate the artificial intelligence into doing something that I care about with that prompt. There's also indirect attacks. So I have an application that I know interacts with artificial intelligence in some way. How can I leverage that application, inject some sort of security threat into that application, and then manipulate an artificial intelligence using that? In terms of infection, this is actually one of the more common ones. It's a supply chain vulnerability. I have a Trojan horse that I want to place into a, in a machine learning model, a machine learning library of some sort. And everyone that now uses that large language model, everyone that now uses that, uh, that neural network, now, has that, now is carrying that infection with me. There's evasion, where um, evasion attacks occur when someone can modify the input of, of the, the artificial intelligence is actually leveraging. So the, the typical example there is a stop sign. Um, you know, a, an artificial intelligence can typically take a look at a stop sign and say, okay, this is a stop sign. However, um, it can also, if you just paint a little bit of green paint on it, a little, bit of, a little bit of gray paint on it, actually look at, look at it as a speed limit sign. That obviously can, um, can, can, um, can impact an autonomous vehicle of some sort. So data poisoning, for instance, um, that happens when you specifically target the actual training process of an artificial intelligence. For instance, um, you know, if you put in enough information um, with respect to the training data set for an artificial intelligence, um, it, it can actually start drawing on or creating bad inferences. So for instance, 
you take a data set and tell it enough times that two plus two equals five, well, over enough, over enough examples of that that it sees in the data, it will start to think, okay, two plus two equals five. Some papers actually state things like, some, some papers actually will state statistics that state um, that about 0.001% of the data in a training set is all that's actually needed to actually push, to actually uh, motivate an artificial intelligence to infer the wrong data. And that is something that we need to actually focus on in terms of cyber attacks. And then finally, you have extraction. That's where you actually prompt an AI enough times and it actually starts to push out trade secrets. You just give it a little bit of a nudge over and over again, asking, what are your secrets? What are addresses? What are names? What are um, other items that, that are trade secrets or IP for an organization? And eventually, the AI will actually pour that out. There are a number more of these from the AI Risk Atlas that you can actually look up in, uh, from IBM. This is not the only organization that does this, but um, they have indexed a number of bias reports, a number of, of um, different kinds of attacks on artificial intelligence that can, be, that can be leveraged. And finally, I just wanted to say that there are several organizations that are looking at this right now. Um, ethics and Responsible AI Deployment, DARPA has a number of programs that are operating in this space. OpenAI is obviously a big one. Um, the partnership on AI focuses heavily on gathering groups, gathering social groups to actually work on how do we, how do, how do we not inject cyber vulnerabilities into artificial intelligence. And the White House is now pushing out a number of reports that are operating in this space. So I'm just going to leave it there. But um, this is all just to say that um, there, there is room to... Excuse me. <clears throat> There is room to, to actually start looking into cyber vulnerabilities when it comes to artificial intelligence. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so, so good afternoon. It's great to be at the University of Colorado Law School in, in Boulder here. I uh, honor to uh, address AI uh, and, and bias along uh, Dr. Campbell and Professor Goodman. Uh, I also just want to just start off by acknowledging uh, Professor Suzette Malvo right here. She is, you know, nationally recognized in terms of constitutional law and civil procedure. She's well respected in terms of civil rights groups. Uh, you know, it, it's great that she is here at the University of uh, Colorado. Also want to thank the Byron White Center for the Study of American Constitutional Law the Silicon Flatiron Center, and the Daniels Fund for sponsoring the session. So now, today I'm going to talk about something that I think is overlooked uh, a lot in terms of AI and bias in the context of democracy. Most sessions that most folks who focus on AI and bias, they focus on contexts like hiring or lending or uh, risk assessment in terms of criminal justice. Uh, when we talk about democracy, most popular discussions focus on, on deceptive deepfakes, right? The basic thesis of my talk today is that the challenges of AI uh, in the context of democracy go well beyond deepfakes. Uh, yes, deepfakes that show President Obama telling people of color to boycott this election are problematic, right? Like that, yeah, that's an issue, right? Yes, AI power cyber attacks and nuisance open record requests targeted at local election offices and, you know, Houston or, uh, you know, a, 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 a tribal, a county or, or Philadelphia or Detroit, uh, that, that's, that's, that's a problem. Uh, here, yes, uh, politicians using machine learning tools to manipulate district lines or to craft um, voting restrictions to shape election outcomes. Yeah, all, all of that <laughs> intentional stuff is a problem. But today, I'm going to take the, this in, these intentional attempts to use AI to deceive or to disenfranchise voters uh, off the table here. I, and I'm going to talk about how bias inherent in AI models 
can undermine democracy. Now, for, before I get started, I really do want to echo uh, Dr. Campbell's point about the fact that there are some good uses, a lot of good uses in terms of AI, in terms of reducing costs, uh, mobilizing voters, um, creating platforms so that people who have different perspectives can see where they may align and may be able to come together and work together. Uh, I'm working on a law review article uh, on, on that, on opportunities. But today, I'm going to focus on these particular harms in terms of bias. I do want to provide a little bit of, of context on where we are a, as a nation in terms of democracy. I think most of us are familiar, but I do want to repeat it just because it's important. First three quarters of our nation's history, we were not a racially inclusive democracy. Immigration laws dating back to 1790 limited citizenship to white, white persons of good moral character, end of quote. And, and that effectively gerrymandered <coughs> democratic majorities that persist to this day, right? In, in most states, voting was limited to white males. Now, over the past six decades, the United States has moved toward becoming a racially inclusive democracy, thanks to two laws passed in 1965, the Voting Rights Act, and also the Immigration and Naturalization Act, which uh, basically uh, removed the uh, Northern uh, European and, and Western European bias in terms of immigration uh, uh, laws. And as a, as a result, people of color have grown as a share of the, the U.S. population from 15% in 1960 to 41% in 2020 and are expected to exceed 50% by, by 2050. People of color have grown from less than 1% of the U.S. Congress in the 1940s to about 25% uh, today uh, here. Uh, now, as our <coughs> nation has become more diverse, our politics uh, have become more, more racially divided. Race is the most significant demographic factor that shapes voting patterns in the United States. It's more significant than sexual orientation, religion, marital status, age, gender, education, class. Political scientists have, political scientists have also documented a rise in cultural anxiety among many Americans who feel as though they're losing status due to demographic changes. Data show that racial antagonism also correlates with a willingness to abandon demogra uh, democratic norms to maintain status. So we got to examine AI bias in the context of all of our progress as a country and also the things that confront us, the challenges that continue to, to confront us. So uh, when I talk about AI, I'm basically talking about learning algorithms developed and trained on historical <coughs> data so they can develop solutions through predictions. Training data sets may be biased for a variety of, of reasons. You know, maybe uh, the data reflects societal inequality that already exists. Uh, some communities may be better represented in the training data. Uh, uh, just as an example, an AI image generator trained on portraits uh, and photos of 44 white males and one black male who have served as U.S. presidents uh, would likely not produce an image of a black female U.S. president uh, here, right? Also, in scraping the web for pictures and texts and accepting them as representative, an AI, an AI foundation model may uh, perpetuate the, the viewpoints that are dominant of those who post on the web. Uh, and, and obviously, this has, has some problems. An example could be, to the extent that traditional news outlets, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. If they produce stories about Black Lives Matter protests that underreport typical people uh, demonstrations that are kind of interracial and inclusive of a variety of people and over cover dramatic confrontations with police, 
a primary source of online data used to train foundation models is likely uh, skewed uh, here, right? And so outputs would, would be, be skewed. Um, Social media platforms often deploy uh, AI-powered content moderation tools that rely on large amounts of training uh, data that are, are susceptible to, to bias. Uh, Facebook employees, for example, revealed that uh, internal company research showed that black U.S. Instagram users were about 50% more likely to have their accounts automatically disabled by the content moderation system. And it's because the system couldn't appreciate context. So for example, black users complain, hey, you can't talk about racism as a problem on Facebook <coughs> or you are removed uh, here. Uh, AI powered, uh, you know, like even addressing the problem with AI is, is an issue. AI powered video deep fake detection systems are often trained on an insufficiently robust number of images of people of color, and as a result have higher error rates uh, with images of people with darker skin. Uh, and now this is something that I think is just completely underexamined in terms of the literature. It's not just skin color, it is language. Uh, in certain areas of the United States, you know, communities, uh, Asian uh, 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 language-speaking communities, uh, tribal uh, communities, Spanish-speaking Spanish uh, communities, they're protected by the language assistance provisions of the Voting Rights Act, Section 203, right? Unfortunately, a very small share of the world's 6,000 languages are represented in large language models. English is by far the dominant language. So although Spanish is the second most uh, popular language in the United States, it's, it's represented in some large language models. It's, it's less well represented in data sets than English. And a large share of the Spanish that's used to train LLMs is mach machine translated from English, right? So it's already substandard Spanish. It's not kind of natural uh, 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 Spanish that's been, been created by, by Spanish speakers. Um, Native American, uh, Alaska Native languages, Hmong, Vietnamese, may be just completely underrepresented or, or un unrepresented or un underrepresented uh, uh, in terms of large language models. And as a result, these tools that facilitate democratic participation translation tools, voice assistance tools, chat bots, content moderation tools, recommendation algorithms, search functions, news aggregation tools. They may be less accurate, nuanced, effective uh, in, in languages other than, than standard uh, English uh, uh, here. Um, I, I mentioned the content moderation issue with regard to black folk in terms of language. Basically, one study showed that Facebook got, they missed 29% of the misinformation in English. They, they missed 70% of the misinformation in Spanish, right? California is required by the Voting Rights Act to, require, to, to provide all election information in both Spanish and English. They've got a chat bot that provides some answers in English, but can't provide those same answers to kind of voting questions in, in, in Spanish, right? So uh, as um, so, so, so this is, is an issue. Now, it's also an issue in terms of election administration. Uh, AI applications used to identify and remove ineligible names from voter registration lists and to perform initial signature verifications for mail-in ballots uh, may, may really be, be flawed, uh, according to some uh, studies uh, uh, here. Um, the, um, um, you know, one, one study of Wisconsin voters revealed that the rate at which voters were erroneously flagged as having moved was 141% higher for people of color than for white folk. 
uh, name matching algorithms have often uh, have, have also um, rendered more mismatches for common names for, for Asian Americans than the most common names uh, of white Americans and uh, black uh, Americans uh, here. Um, so um, when we talk about the signature verification uh, software on mail-in ballots, the accuracy rate ranges from 74% to 96%. So this is mail-in ballot comes in, they check the signature against what they have on the record automatically, and if you don't match and a human says you don't match, you, 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 get, you get thrown out uh, here. So um, now, kind of, as I kind of pull all this stuff together, these issues are not simply limited to bias, right? But the shortcomings of these foundation models in adequately serving all in a pluralistic, diverse society, because foundation models often address diversity in mathematical ways by defaulting to averages or dominant patterns, they often fail to reflect diverse perspectives. This is inconsistent with pluralism and just uh, 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 pluralism in uh, democracy. I hear technologists have already have only started to deal with this. I don't. I don't mean to be alarmist, but I, I do think we just need to make sure that AI is not just like a continuation of. Conquests that we've seen in the past with imperialism, manifest destiny, forced assimilation uh, here. Uh, unfortunately, many of these issues are not dealt with by the Voting Rights Act. Uh, there are some ways forward, however, and when we get to Q&A, look forward to uh, talking about those in, in more uh, detail. Okay, thank you. Well, why don't we just go ahead and get started. I was um, giving lots of thanks to everyone who helped put this event together. So thank you to the staff and for those of you who are taking time out of your lunch break to, um, to, spend, uh, to spend it with us. So I'm going to do in my brief 15 minutes um, a quick <laughs> introduction. I'm going to talk a little bit about the ethical obligations that attorneys have. How many of you have taken ethics? Okay, all right, all the attorneys in the room, hopefully. <laughs> all right, so I'm just going to highlight just one ethical rule, just one ethical rule, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about bias and machine learning processes. My co-panelists have already given you some background in these biases, and I'm going to give you just um, a, a way to think about the different, ca how to categorize the different biases that can be operating so you know um, what, to, what to look for. So, um, all right, introduction, we've done that. All right, so the legal and ethical requirements for employing artificial intelligence, I'm just gonna start with the rules. The first thing to think about is, um, I start from the premise of the ABA model rules, which basically say it's misconduct for a lawyer to engage in conduct that they know or should know is discrimination or harassment on the basis of one of these protected classes, all right? So it happens in the conduct of your law practice. So whatever you're doing to, in your law practice, so that could be hiring summer clerks. It could be doing research. It could be writing briefs. It could be taking on appellate arguments. It could be participating in amicus briefs, okay? So all of those things are impacted by um, in the practice of law. So um, Colorado rule of professional conduct is a little bit different. The ABA has this model rule that um, many states or a number of states have adopted, but in Colorado, it's conduct that exhibits or is intended to appeal to or engender bias. So we've got that Colorado is a little bit um, higher, um, higher standard in, for an attorney to be, to be um, uh, culpable because we have to show that they were intending to appeal to biases or actually physically exhibiting those biases. All right, so that's just something to think about. Colorado does also make it clear that this conduct um, can be uh, an ethical violation regardless of if it is involving opposing counsel or a witness, but it can involve 
parties, judges, judicial officers, staff, any of that kind of conduct that's being engaged in is, uh, is an issue. So how does this all relate to artificial intelligence? Um, all right, so artificial intelligence impacts these four duties, which you probably talked about in your classes on, um, on ethics. The duty of competence. Lawyers need to be competent to understand the technology that they're using as part of their legal practice. If you're using chat GPT, which you know you shouldn't to write briefs, right? <laughs> <laughs> if you're using it, understand what its limitations are. Understand how you need to, um, as Dr. Campbell said, um, train it properly, right? So it's a well-behaved chat GPT and doesn't hallucinate. Um, the, the cost issue um, is something that, um, that uh, Professor Overton already mentioned. The fact that you can do things faster and quicker. You can serve more clients. You can actually give more people access to justice. So that is a very important consideration. The duty of communication. Well, when the client asked you, how did you decide this was a good settlement number? And you said, ah, AI told me. <laughs> okay? No, no, no. No. How are you able to communicate with the client if you don't understand enough about what's going in to the technology and how it's being used? And then finally, there's the duty of compliance or supervision, as some refer to it. Would you ever, okay, attorneys in the room, have you ever had a junior associate, maybe a summer clerk, do an assignment for you? Anyone? Yeah? Would you ever just walk right into court with that? <laughs> Here, Your Honor. <laughs> no, no, of course not. Of course not. You have to supervise. You have to review it. You have to train the associate so that the next level is better, and the next one is better, and the next one is better. And that is another um, issue that we need to be concerned about with artificial intelligence. So in terms of understanding bias in machine learning, um, We've got four minutes, right? You're good. Okay. Um, understanding bias. I'll talk just a little bit about some of the some of the inputs and some of the um, the programming issues. So there are basically um, I'm going to focus on six basic sources of bias in machine learning processes. The first one is historical bias, as um, Professor Overton mentioned. If you put up all the portraits of all the past presidents, guess what? The data is going to be biased. It's not going to put pick me as a potential presidential candidate, much as I would like. Yeah. <laughs> um, so historical, that's, that's one. Representation bias is similar, right? With representation bias, we're looking at who has been represented in the data set, right? And so um, it, some groups may be underrepresented, not just because of history, like with presidents, but it's because a lot of the um, data sets that are being used, as our, my colleagues have mentioned, are white Europeans, right? Or, or Asian males. Yeah, but that's a lot of the data that's being used. So the rest of us in this room that don't fit into either of those categories are not being represented. When the, when the technologies are being trained, they don't have information about me. And so therefore, they're not going to be very good about making predictions about me. But when their predictions about me impact my life in negative ways, then that is a, a large concern. Um, in terms of measuring, we measure what counts. And if we don't have data about it, we, it doesn't count. So for those of you who are my age or older, um, we, did we measure first generation college students? We didn't keep track of that statistic. No one thought to think about how different the experience is for first generation students, first in their families to go to school. No one thought about that. And because no one thought about that, we had no data on that. So we couldn't make predictions about what they needed to succeed. And um, so similarly, there are lots of other areas that we still do not measure and do not have data on. Um, my last three, aggregating, uh, evaluating, and, and deploying. So with aggregation bias, what happens is you lump groups together as though they are all the same. All right, so if I came in here and I said, okay, I'm going to have each, each of you identify your height, all right? We're going to identify everybody's height. I'm going to put all those data points in, and then I'm going to say, okay, the average height in this room is five foot eight. Well, what does that really mean? The average height of people at the University of Colorado in Boulder is five foot eight? Probably not. 
I have no idea. But if we're just putting things together without figuring out um, what needs to be disaggregated, then we're going to have trouble with our, with our bias. Um, evaluation bias occurs when um, the, the benchmarks that you're using just aren't matched in the representative population. And then finally, deployment bias. I'm going to give you some examples up there. If deployment bias is when artificial intelligence technologies are used in a way that they were not designed to be used. So one common example of that is, have you heard about bail calculations, judges? Okay, so those bail calculations, um, the technologies that do that, what happens is the judge then takes that calculation and then plunders it, and then she decides what she wants to do for bail. Well, the technology wasn't designed to let the judge ponder it and then let the judge decide because that's not part of, you know, part of what was, what was researched. That's not part of the understanding. And for that reason, the program, some studies have shown that you get a worse result. You're less accurate when you combine the human and the machine with programs like this than you would be if either the human or the machine were making the difference, uh, making the decision. So that is a concern, though we, we do talk about having humans um, in the loop being important. Oh, sorry, we're just going to take that. All right, so then what, what should we do about all this? Why does this, um, why does this matter? And um, the thing that I want you to, to keep in mind is, um, as uh, Dr. Campbell said, you need to train your pet, right? AI is a pet. Well, I had a black lab for many years, and he learned how to go get the ball, but he would never bring it back. <laughs> he could sit, he could lie down, and he could shake, and that was it, all right? We sent him to doggy school for eight weeks. He came back perfectly trained, off-leash, on-leash. Within a month, he had forgotten it all because, because we weren't good trainers, all right? So my, my caution is I'd like lawyers to try to be, try to be trainers, train, train your, your, um, your pet so it's not like a, a, menace, a menace to others, all right? So some of it is, um, I want you law students particularly, lawyers too, but law students, try to take an interest in this. Right? See what you can learn about technology and the law. And encourage, when you go out to firms or organizations or start your own, encourage lawyers to be involved with the designers, with the software engineers, because then we'll get better legal AI uh, technologies to use. Um, obviously, you want to be concerned about um, the data sets. And my colleagues have already talked about the data sets. Where did this data come from? How, how did you um, narrow it down? Who was represented? Who wasn't? What was left out? What were the considerations in deciding how to, um, how to put this data set together? Because that will give you a sense of the, um, of the limitations. You as an attorney, if you're going to vendors, you want to ask them, tell me about these data sets. Are these diverse data sets? If that's going to be relevant to, um, to your practice and to making sure that you do what you, um, what you need to do. And then finally, I just want to caution you. Just I know for some of you it's scary, but just learn enough to understand the limitations of AI. You know, take a, a little course, do a few more CLEs or something, but just or read a book, um, but try to understand the limitations of artificial intelligence technologies. And, um, and then hopefully you will, you will not go wrong. So I love this quote from a former California Supreme Court justice. Uh, the sooner we realize that we are often already essentially working in organizations that are mixed machine intelligence and human intelligence, um, the better we'll be to, able to think about what are the right uses for these technologies. So thank you very much for your time and attention and sorry for that. All right, I think we have time for a question before people have to go off to class. I know that you're sort of in a transition point, so before all the students, not all of you, stay if you can. But for those of you who have to go to class, you know, maybe in a couple of minutes, we'll go ahead and release you. But can I take questions from the audience, folks who are um, interested and intrigued by what you have heard today? There is a lot to think about. So I'm gonna open up the floor for um, the students, and we don't have, I don't think our mic is exactly the the, the, the movable mic is working, and so we'll just uh, we'll just take I'll I'll repeat your question if it's not heard. How about that? All right, who wants to get us started? 
all the way in the back. Um, sorry, you're the, the yes. red hat. <laughs> uh, do you think AI has a place in education? And if so, what is that role it would have? To anyone? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it definitely has a, a place in education, and I've done some research on using artificial intelligence technologies as tutors in K through 12 education, particularly in under-resourced schools. So that would be that's one one use where that growth and a lot of the, these um, uh, concerns that we have can be can be mitigated and can actually do a lot a lot of good in um, sort of leveraging teacher time. If I can chime in on that one. So um, one of the things that was mentioned earlier is that AI often takes averages. A lot of the newer um, forms of artificial intelligence does a lot of sampling. So it looks at these spaces of guesses as sampling distributions and will pluck answers from that distribution. And so when it comes to education, what that means is students are going to start getting different explanations for the same kind of subject matter. And that's really helpful, especially in the STEM field, where it takes a thousand ways to understand a mathematical formula before you actually understand a mathematical formula, to teach that. Um, and it, what this is doing is it's just going to be opening up students to those kinds of explanations. Obviously, it has detriments in terms of students being able to you know, have essays written and things like that for them. But I think that, that it's going to be on us to adopt the education system um, or adapt the education system to these technologies existing, starting to give students lessons that are more focused on critical thinking than, like, uh, like my colleague said, rote learning. And through that, um, hopefully we can actually leverage the technology to make it better. Yes. I'm curious if you can kind of like, uh, share perspective on how AI can improve like judges' performance support whenever they're ruling on statutes or making decisions in cases. Um, I'm not an attorney, but I'm, I'm dating one. And <laughs> oftentimes, judges just flat out <coughs> interpret statutes wrong, misapply rules. And I understand there's a process in place to correct those things after the fact. But it, are you seeing how AI is emerging in like decision support for, for the, the judges' like decision making? <laughs> we both looked at you. <laughs> um, as far as far as judges' decision making, um, there's obviously a lot of danger in that, um, based on even some of the historical biases that we were that, that we were discussing. You know, I, I I I wouldn't argue that we want to continue having judges' decisions based on the history of us of of those judicial decisions. However, what it can do. Um, and this is something that, um, that I've seen more in you know, DA's offices and prosecutor's offices, is ingest data on the history of those decisions and reveal insights, things that you may not have seen, like, oh, we are doing, we, we are having um, a higher percentage of harsher um, sentences for people of a specific race. Those are the kinds of things that you would want um, artificial intelligence to, to be able to tell you. Um, but as far as the actual decisions, yeah, I would certainly leave that to the humans. <laughs> uh, I, I just would quickly note that there are different types of decisions that a judge makes. You know, some are factual decisions, some are, you know, interpreting the law. When we talk about risk assessment, there was talked to you just kind of some flaws in terms of risk assessment. I think transparency is really important. One of the problems is the black box and basically people being sentenced and they don't understand why there's, or they're not receiving bail or whatever. They don't understand what's behind that. So I am very much in favor of whether it's law students or other folks using AI tools to get feedback. Like I write something and I send it to people for feedback and I don't necessarily agree with everything they say, but having that feedback helps. And I think that AI tools can be used in a, a similar way. Uh, just, if I could just add to that right. point, logical reasoning and logical consistency um, is something that, if, that from the early observations, we've actually seen that LLMs are actually really good at assessing. So not write something that's logically reasonable, but if I've written something, if I've written an essay and I ingest it into this, where am I being inconsistent? Um, that's something that, um, that, that you can certainly train some LLMs to tell you.
Yeah, yeah, and I think um, I, I too share the concern about having, I'm sorry, more decisions, um, uh, more influenced by artificial intelligence than by, than by judges, but we also have the fact that many judges are biased. Right, judges already have biases, so which one do we want, right? The problem with artificial intelligence is any bias that's in there is magnified exponentially. One judge can make 10 bad decisions in a month or something, 100, but one judge with AI, ooh, a lot, a lot more. So, um, so yeah, so the, the uses, I think, in, in testing and also testing the judge, it, him or herself, right? Um, go through all my past decisions and see if you see a pattern. Well, then I can learn from that, and that can help me to work on reducing the bias that I exhibited, whether it was intentional or not. So that's a use I would, I would see as an important one. Thank you. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and resume. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'd like to welcome our panelists back. Thank you so much for a very informative session. Each of these talks has given us a lot to, to think about and to digest. And again, I want to encourage people to come back tomorrow remotely or in person for um, our conference where we're going to do a deep dive on AI and the Constitution and all the different kinds of areas. And I'm sure bias is going to be part of that conversation, right? We're going to be talking about privacy the interpretation of the Constitution and other statutes, as well as the First Amendment and free speech. Um, and all of those, I think, bias can be implicated. Um, so let me open up the floor for questions. I see my colleague Deep will start with you. And other people sort of be thinking about what questions we have an incredible group of experts in front of us. So do take advantage of this moment. Um, my colleague Deep. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, so I'm reliably told by the keynote for tomorrow that Apparently, there's a panel addressing this tomorrow, but I am curious about your the response that you gave to judges and the use of AI. Um, is that really a unique AI, critique of AI, or is it just fundamentally a critique of originalism and textualism as a form of judicial interpretation? And what, what new things are is the addition of AI bringing to those critiques? Let me start. Okay. Um, does this work? Hello. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay. Um, one of the new things that it adds is just the, the volume and the velocity. How quickly things multiply, I think, is a huge, huge concern. So, so that's probably where I would start. And the, yeah, the, the volume and, and, and the, um, the amount of of change that, that can result. If you just think about originalism versus um, versus uh, textualism, then I think we could get technologies that would be very good at figuring out originalism and would be very good at understanding what the textual response um, response would be. But um, but I would still have have concerns about um, about judges relying too much upon that. Yeah, just, just from a practical perspective, um, thinking about the use of artificial intelligence really in any, in any capacity, you really want to get an understanding of what are your goals, right? So and that's, that's technology in general. What are your goals? Is what your goals are inevitably decide how you're going to use that technology and how you're going to do it responsibly. And we were just having a conversation kind of during the, the five-minute break about, well, what is the intent? Is the intent um, uh, for us to have a judicial system in which there is some subjectiveness among among, among the judges where they, where they can make decisions um, based on very human factors, things that are almost too complex for a technology to decide and something that almost reflects the will of the people in a, in a lot of ways. Um, that's still a very difficult thing for an AI to do, but it is something that an AI can help out with. Um, again, that the, the example that, that I used earlier of you know, gathering enough data using OSINT and a bunch of other technologies open source intelligence, sorry, um, to to gather enough data to say, hey, here's the history of prosecutions in this in this space. Here's the history of people of a certain race, a certain gender, a certain uh, you know, sexual orientation or sex or gender. Um, here's the history of them being prosecuted in this way. That's the kind of information um, that we could that we could pull on and then still have a human with all of their nuance, with all of their context about the real world actually making those decisions. And I think originalism versus textualism is still up for debate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.
The, at least to me, the big issue is kind of the black box problem in terms of, I mean, there's a decision, a judge has a perspective that's textualist or originalist, they lay it out in terms of an opinion. I may disagree with it, but I see what's there, right? In terms of some of these automated decisions and not necessarily knowing how they're, they're really made and what's behind them, I think that that is an, an issue and a problem that we, we, we haven't really, really solved in terms of automated decision making, right? Uh, Harry, so my colleague, who is also the keynote tomorrow, so we're going to give him the floor. Yeah, well, thank you. What a terrific uh, set of talks. I only wish we had a, an hour or more for each of you instead of 15 minutes, so thank you so much. Uh, one question I, I have for the panel, and, and I'm as guilty of this as anybody else with my own scholarship, but um, I heard themes from uh, Spencer and Chris's and even Newton's panels that uh, there's so much uh, structural bias outside of AI in the world at large, and while we, it's really important to be focusing on the problems of AI, do we risk kind of missing the forest for the trees and uh, focusing too much effort on tweaking AI and missing all of the maybe more impactful stuff outside in society? And so I'd just love to get your opinions on that. I think to some extent from a, from a regulatory standpoint, um, we can become guilty of that. And I guess, you know, in, in, this, in, in this space, we're really talking regulatory and, 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 and legal. Um, I definitely think that um, from some of the laws that um, I've seen at least drafted, certain policies that I've seen drafted by folks in Congress um, just through advising, um, there, is a, there is a bit of missing, missing the forest for the trees. Um, I think a lot of, and, and I think that has to do a lot, a, a lot with our history. A lot of laws, a lot of policies are crafted based on bad things happening, right? You know, something, something bad happens, and we go, oh, we need a policy for this. Um, and we don't always think about, well, what are the eight million other positive things this thing is doing, and how is it going to slow that? Th how is it going to slow that thing down? Um, I, I, I certainly think that you know we. It would be useful to have policymakers and have regulators in that instance have some set of, whether it's panelists, whether it's a team of experts that actually operate in these areas, giving them the, giving them the nuance about the technology um, to help inform them of how to make the precise laws or precise regulations that, that, that would actually help to curb bad behavior whether it's doxing, whether it's cyberbullying, whether it is you know mass um, uh, you know mass influence of elections, um, you know helping them to make laws that crap that, that that deter that kind of behavior while still allowing everyone else the flexibility and the room for growth in in, in these AI areas. Thanks. And I think we've been trying for a really long time to fight and combat discrimination and fairness, and we haven't really succeeded, right? We've succeeded in small ways. And um, again, I go back to sort of, you know, being the chicken little, the sky is falling, ringing the alarm bell. But because of automation bias, people think if the machine made the decision, it must be right. And because of that, that's why I'm really concerned that we need to tackle this problem. Right. And, you know, the U.S., sorry to say, but we're really far behind. Right, the EU, UK, everyone, you know, um, Europe is much farther along in terms of understanding what are the risks of artificial intelligence technologies and what do we need to do to protect consumers from those risks. Very practical, not a legal uh, answer, right? Um, structurally, we have not dealt with a lot of these issues in terms of the political branches. Uh, Either the courts are preventing political actors from doing so, or political actors, there's not the will, right? We're moving, I am less optimistic. I, you know, I think the Brussels effect in terms of us relying on the EU to regulate is probably gonna dominate. Like our politics are polarized in terms of this, and just as in the social media <coughs> realm, where this has become very political, I think we're moving toward, you know, folks being concerned about woke AI and a debate as we have some discussions in terms of these issues. So, frankly, it is a little easier 
to go to open AI or Anthropic and say, here are the problems. You understand the problems in terms of lack of pluralism here. How can we work with these issues and deal with these issues uh, here? Right. Thank you. I just want, to, and I want to follow up a little bit. So, Professor Overton, if you could, you said a lot in terms of like what you know, so what what's going wrong? What kind of solutions? I'm wondering if you have ideas, solutions. Maybe that's the next article, right? In terms of how to address some of these. And then for Professor Goodman, I wanted to um, ask this question, especially because we have lawyers in the room. Um, how do you think law firms, right, if you think about your ethical um, responsibility, law firms using, say, algorithmic hiring, right, to look for lawyers to hire folks, what kinds of warnings do you have or caution or considerations? Is that something that you think is uh, problematic? Um, we talk a lot about this in my employment discrimination class, sort of this bias in AI. And so maybe you can speak a little bit to that as well while we have some uh, law firm folks in the room. So maybe, um, Ms. Overton, you want to start? Okay, I think one big thing that we need to think about in terms of legal education is recognizing that this is really a significant part of the future and that our students are going to be shaping the law and shaping the future. That these are opportunities. There's not a silver bullet that we're going to come up with here or over the next year in terms of dealing with all of this stuff that, you know, this is an opportunity to shape the country, the world, the law uh, here in terms of a career uh, here and, and preparing them uh, for that. So it's not a yes AI or no AI. This is coming, the world's coming, and we need really thoughtful minds to, to deal with that. that that's one. I'm really big into principles as opposed to kind of silver bullets in this space in terms of solutions because we don't know all of the harms yet and we're really trying to figure it out. And, and these are big problems because the foundation models that we talked about, you know, a single foundation model is often the, the, the foundation, frankly, for various AI applications uh, here. So one flawed foundation model can, there can be just ripple effects across various applications. So, so big things for me would be, you know, some high standards of care in terms of anticipating uh, harms for uh, developers as well as those folks who deploy um, uh, equity assessments uh, here, uh, independent audits uh, here, uh, some public disclosure so that we can see things and deal with the black box problem and we don't, and, and this issue of kind of the mathematical certainty, if the machine said it, it must be right, we can kind of get rid of that, that by having, having some disclosure uh, here. And then I think the other piece, and I think this was implicit in my comments, um, yes, the bias issue is a big problem. There's this design issue. If we believe in pluralism, and if we as a liberal democracy believe that we should respect different people who have some different perspectives and we should be able to live together and there can be legitimate different perspectives, that's not conducive to averaging. That's not conducive to just kind of homogenization. Everybody's got to be similar. So how do we deal with that design flaw in terms of AI and reconcile that with pluralism, right? Thank you. All right. So my question was to the uh, law firm, leaders, right, and um, about using artificial intelligence technologies for, for hiring. Um, one really important consideration is what is the data that's being used to train the technology? Now, who do you want to hire in your firm? Many of us want to hire a little me. <laughs> right? <laughs> because look, I succeeded. I'm not someone just like me. Well, if diversity is a concern at your firm or something you want to consider, then using my resume to get more people who are me is not going to promote diversity. And you know that. You do know that, or you reasonably should know that. And so ethical rules can be can be violated. So what's something to think about? Not just getting resumes to train the, the AI on from your own firm, but from other 
hiring firms that are diverse, that are, are as high a quality or that are aspirational in quality for you. And that could be a way that you can make sure that you're not replicating yourself. Now, if your firm is incredibly diverse and you want to just replicate, you know, everyone gets another me, that, you know, that would, that would be fine. But that's definitely um, uh, something to, to think about for, um, for the hiring uh, process. And then you've all heard the stories, right? If, uh, Google resumes, you know, only men should work for Google. Um, lots of um, these tools screen out women, screen out people who have children, screen out people from rep backgrounds that aren't well represented. That goes back to the representation, representation issue, which really all goes back to the data issue. Mm -hmm. Now, the concern here, of course, is, and I'm you know, looking around the room, um, to the diverse law students and diverse lawyers. You're going to have to disclose information about you. You're going to have to have your data be part of these data sets in order for us to make real meaningful change. And there is a lot of hesitation for all of the reasons that, we, that we've talked about and more that we'll talk about tomorrow. And really quick, really quickly on that on, on that last topic, you know, you are going to have to disclose that. And in a lot of ways, there are there are structures that are currently set up um, in in order to anonymize anonymize some of that data, even in in terms of storage. How do you keep tables separate that you know have racial, gender, structural data, all of those things? But going back to um, sort of the cyber vulnerabilities space. Um, you know, there are ways of, there are, there are very nuanced techniques that one can use to pull that information out and recombine it using our, using artificial intelligence. And I think um, just an interesting subject matter, one that you may want to explore is, you know, what regulations, what liability gets placed on companies that are, that, that would, that would use an AI to do some of that work. Um, what, what liabilities get placed on the people who made the AI in the first place? Where, where is the liability um, for that, for that kind of use, which is always my interesting question for the lawyers. <laughs> Great. I'm seeing li I, I, lots of questions. So All right. right there. And then if, yes, and then you're next. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, so thank you so much for your presentations. I think they were so interesting. I am not a lawyer. I consider myself lawyer adjacent because I'm a public policy professional. So I work on the development of public policy and my background's been in technology. So working in big technology firms um, for over 15 years. So from the beginning of GDPR and where you see the principles that informed the European basis for the legal um, arguments that they have now and how that's actually been applied internally and externally. And so I think this is very similar to the principles that have guided the privacy regulations around the world and what are some of the ideas that we need to think about in terms of what do we learn from those ideals that we've held dear as humans for so long and then let those come into the ways that we actually regulate policy discussions, right, and regulate technologies. Um, but my questions are actually very specific. So um, coming from that background, I'm wondering, how have you been seeing um, any AI tools? So I have like three questions. I'll try and get them all out there so you can answer them hopefully. Um, but have you seen um, AI being used by civil rights groups to go in and monitor and report back on judges who are currently sitting on benches and making decisions and being able to inform both the public and those judges about the impacts of their decisions. And so that would be my first question. Like, is there, has there been a trend in that area? Do you see a trend coming forward in that area? Um, another question I have is, do you see like some sort of a sandboxing around AI tools and how they're used for judges or in courtrooms to see if you could run tests of AI decision-making or AI applications at the same time you're running human decision-making and applications and running those separately but sandboxed so you can kind of see what are the outcomes and what are the potential pitfalls of those processes. And then the third would be, what kind of education do we need to do for those judges who are currently sitting on benches to make sure that they understand how AI is being used, how, they're, how it's being applied, what is the technology, what is the impact of that technology? Because if you listen, for instance, to our Supreme Court, they tend to really fall short on knowledge about technologies and is there a way that we can reach out and educate that group um, so they can make better decisions in this area. And before you take that on, <laughs> I'm going to, after you answer that, I'm going to go ahead and collect the rest of the questions so everybody can get their questions out and then have our panelists sort of cherry pick a little bit in terms of being able to respond to everyone. So if you can make that answer quick and then we'll collect the questions. Okay. 
Sure. First, I'd say if um, if you started this whole thing with GDPR, you've been on a wild ride um, <laughs> just just this this entire time. I'm start, starting with the civil rights question. Um, my two colleagues here might have a little bit more knowledge um, than me, but I've certainly seen reports from groups like SPLC, um, from groups like the Atlantic Council, which isn't exactly a civil rights group, but focuses on protection of democracies around the world. We've definitely used. Um, it, 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 on my part, machine learning to um, aggregate data, right? Understand you know whether or not specific data is out there that can give us summaries, that can give us some statistics um, that can yield potential insights beyond basic statistics. So um, history of history of arrests of certain groups, um, the overall usage of a technology, and how that aligns with. Um, a rise in arrests of particular minority groups, things like those are, have been reports of the Atlanta Council, um, and so on and so forth. Um, for the judicial sandbox, I'll, if, if either of you two have a, a better answer to, to, to that. Uh, you I do. I'll wait until some more questions are okay. out to okay. respond to. Right. And the, I'm trying to remember the third one, sorry. <laughs> Education for judges. Education for judges. So my my opinion on that is it is very hard to educate a person who has been a, a, a wiser person who has been uh, you know in, um, in 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 a field um, for 30, 40 years um, on some of the nuances of artificial intelligence. That's not saying we shouldn't attempt to do that. I definitely think we should give them um, a basis for, you know, give them a baseline understanding of that. But as I said before, I, I do feel that um, there would be a lot of benefit um, to multiple aspects of our democracy, the legislature, the judicial, um, the executive branch, and yes, the fourth estate. Um, I believe they all could benefit from having groups or, and, and having access to groups of social uh, subject matter experts who can educate them on the nuances of new technology on, you know, as, as these things occur, because it's only going to get faster. And you've observed for all four of, 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 of those groups that they are, that they are, that they are wildly negligent when it comes to, when it, when it comes to techno, when it, when it comes to new technologies, you know, I, was talking to a congressperson the other day that I can't say who just found out that ChatGPT existed a month ago. That's that's where we are. <laughs> so, so I'm going to go ahead and take some questions. Let me go ahead and collect the questions, put them out there, and then mm -hmm. let our panelists go ahead and decide which ones they'd like to answer. Mm -hmm. So I think the gentleman, you had your hand up afterwards, yeah. or do you want to go ahead? Everybody oh, is going to spit out their question. What's that? Oh, okay. My question uh, was related to precisely how you. So I come at it from a technology point of view. Um, if we're trying to reduce bias, how do we measure bias so that it can be reduced? And we, we talked about what doesn't work, what does work. Um, okay, thank you, that's one. Do we have some other questions here in the back? In the back, go ahead, yes? Sure, uh, my name's Dan Murray. I run a group called the Rocky Mountain AI Interest Group. We have a situation in Colorado right now where there's a bill proposed that's a consumer AI protection bill and it's going to be uh, del deliberated next Wednesday. But so it deals with this algorithmic discrimination that we're talking about. The problem from the AI community is we feel like it's going to squash innovation and AI companies are going to leave the state because they say we can't. So just an opinion on state level versus federal level regulation. Thank you. To your left. Yeah, so I have some good questions. Um, the first question is actually on the historical areas. <coughs> are you talking about? Can you hear me? Yeah, we're just going to take one question. Okay, so let me just go with the most important one. So, like, I'm coming from the company, compliance background. I'm like, and I work on, like, you know, investigating bias, right? So, like, are there legal implications or sanctions for companies that deploy, you know, bias, AI tools? Because sometimes we have these companies, you know, that some of those tools are not, like, represented of the read data, right? And they deploy it for other models, right? Are there, like, sanctions or legal implications for something like that, like, from the legal folks here? Okay, thank Should you. I go to one in the front right here. Yeah, yeah uh, yes. just on the bill that's pending uh, in our state house, the discriminatory bias, I just wanted you to weigh in on, um, isn't that covered in current discriminatory, dis in current bias uh, laws that we have? So if these systems are discriminatory, um, it's actually the person that's using the system that's, you know, perpetuating the discrimination. 
So, so do we need laws specific to the systems if we've got laws based on how we're supposed to conduct ourselves as humans? Okay. That's the and question. the last question goes to a student, Allison. Oh, thanks. Uh, going off of the measurement question, should, shouldn't we be setting those de-biasing objective functions up front now instead of on the back end, like in an auditing phase or disclosures after the LLMs are in existence and fully functioning? All right, so I'm gonna ask you to take one. Each of you take a question. <laughs> 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 Not three. <laughs> take one that you like. <laughs> Uh, they're, all, they're, they're, all, they're all connected uh, here, I think, or many of them. Uh, I, on the judge's piece, I want to refer to a piece of a colleague at GW. Her name is Alicia Sobel Niederman. It's Do Cases Generate Bad AI Law? Uh, it's in the Columbia Science and Technology Law Review. Uh, I think that um, the baseline issue is always a challenge, particularly in terms of Perhaps humans are more biased than machines in some contexts, like on the signature match. I think it's still unclear on the, on the mailing ballots uh, of these. Uh, I, I do think setting up guidelines up front, you know, uh, uh, anthropic is basically kind of got some constitutional principles that they're trying to establish up front. I think up front is important, after the fact is important as well. I think all of it is important in terms of getting a measurement. And then finally, in terms of this legal implication piece, um, yeah, there is liability uh, generally in, in terms of folks, you can't have a company that uses a tool that discriminates and then says it's not liable because of the tool, right? However, we are moving into this space where I think it's very clear <clears throat> that Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act does not apply to many of these, you know, chatbots and, 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 and platforms. They are making a material contribution to the content that's created. They're not just kind of a neutral piece that says, let me just post your uh, defamation on my social media page and I haven't done anything. They're making a material contribution. And so I, I don't think that they get the same uh, immunity that many other platforms would in terms of Section 230. Okay, I really want to answer all of the questions, but I'm going to try to follow your directions. Um, to go to, um, to your question about, do we already have legal sanctions, right? And isn't that enough? Yes, it's already, you know, inappropriate, illegal, whatever, to discriminate, right? But if you're looking at constitutional discrimination, and discrimination that violates the Constitution, guess what? It needs to be intentional discrimination. Right. Do you intend to use your algorithm in this way? You don't even know what it's doing. So no one's going to be responsible for that. Mm -hmm. um, rarely do the designers actually design it intending for it to discriminate in inappropriate ways. They just don't care or don't know, or don't, you know, don't have time, whatever. It's just not what, what really, really matters. Or, or focus on innovation, right? They're focusing on making money in innovation as opposed to, they're not trying to be evil. They're trying to make money and innovate, as they yeah, would say, right? Yeah, and there's ways, too, that if people are <clears throat> more able to trust AI, there will be more innovation. There will be more opportunities. And the legislatures will stop cracking down so much if we had more responsible AI, more ethical AI. So I think that's, that's part of it. And then the final thing, sorry, um, just for impact, right? If it's an employment situation, um, you, if you don't have to prove intentional discrimination if there is a disparate impact. So all of the African Americans are booted out of the system, right? How do I know who was in the system? when AI is figuring, you know, picking the resumes and all of that. So it goes back to the black box. I don't know how many other black people were booted out. The company may know, the designers may be able to find out, but we don't, so we don't have a case. Mm. All right, just a, just a few topics. Um, so first of all, in terms of the, in terms of the implication, what, I, I don't have a, an answer to that. One, because I'm not a lawyer, you know, I'm on the technical side. Um, but two, it does ring of the discussion about guns don't kill people, people kill people, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, in, in this case, is it the AI that you want to regulate or is it the person? I think that's the discussion mm -hmm. um, that, needs to, that needs to happen. And as with the gun discussion, it's, 
it's both, <laughs> right? It, 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 you want my answer on it. Um, in terms of the in terms of the innovation piece, I absolutely understand and feel you. I think um, what the, the congressperson that I was referring to was a state congressperson, um, and I think they are at a, at a point where they want not this state, by the way, um, they, the, <laughs> but they are at a point where they want to do something, and it's now becoming a question of um, state versus federal versus international in terms of this kind of regulation is inherently related to the internet. So we can't pull away, we can't pull away from that, but they need to have an understanding that, um, uh, you know, they, that most of this is going to be interstate activity. All of this is surrounding interstate commerce. And I, it, it is my opinion that um, much of the states should be pressuring the federal government to actually act on, on, on these matters because of that interstate nature of all of this. And finally, in terms of the biasing AI question or, or reducing the bias, I find that we look at the notion of bias too linear. Um, it's not necessarily reduce or increase bias. Yes, those things can happen. Um, but I, for me, and when, when we were talking about ethics, whether it was back at NASA or DOD or any of those things, it's about characterizing and understanding bias, right? It's understanding what the tool can and can't do, understanding how the tool works and how it will operate that is going to get you to whatever it is that your goals are as an organization or as a democracy, not just simply going, we, we're going to pull back on the, the level of bias that it has or, or, or increase it in a particular direction. Great, thank you. I am sorry I couldn't get to all of your questions. I think it's just a testament to the fact that this is a huge topic and we need a lot more time to talk about it. So come and see these amazing folks at the end with your questions, if you'd like, and come tomorrow to the conference so we can continue this dialogue. Just thank our amazing